What would you do if your daughters told you that their dead mom was knocking on the walls of your house? Imagine going up to your daughter's bedroom and finding out it was not their mother, but actually an unfamiliar boy with a hatchet in his hand, dressed as your deceased wife. Sounds like it was gotten straight out of a horror story, right? But for Brian Andrews, this was not the case. In today's episode of Crime Diaries, we would give voice to the eerie story of Daniel LaPlante's murders and the peculiar precedents which led him in doing such gruesome deeds. The bizarre story of Daniel holds an uncanny but intriguing prestige in the archives of true crime. His story is infamous, not because of the ghoulish murders he committed, but rather because of the events which preceded them. Born in Townsend, Massachusetts in the year 1970, Daniel LaPlante suffered from a disturbing childhood from which his traumatic response began. According to the police reports, his troubled upbringing includes psychological and sexual abuse at the hands of different adults in his life. His father and stepfather allegedly tormented him physically, emotionally, and sexually, as one could imagine. This inhumane fostering affected his young life, from which he struggled socially and academically. At school, his classmates would call and refer to him as creepy and weird. He was also diagnosed with dyslexia, which added to his distress in his school days. In his teenage years, Daniel was referred to a psychiatrist by the school officials due to his atypical behavior and reluctance for hygiene and self-improvement. Such a particular matter could have been a critical turning point in young Daniel's life, which may have prevented his crimes if it were not for the dreadful episodes that arose. In a testimony, his relationship with the psychiatrist began to take a dark turn when the psychiatrist began to abuse him sexually which went on for a year. Predictably, Daniel ended his therapy sessions in a worse condition than when he began. Like his father before him, the psychiatrist who was trusted to help Daniel was in fact another case of sexual abuse that would add torment to his already ill-fated existence. In his early teenage years, Daniel established himself as a thief by breaking into people's properties in the Townsend area stealing some of their valuables, and spending the evening in the house. As his robbery skills escalate, his curiosity and desire to afflict paranoia and torment to his victims also arise. His motive for burglary was certainly not for the sole reason of taking people's possessions, but to also inflict psychosis by leaving items and specific details in his wake. He would move furniture and even small items around in his victims' homes in a way that would impose that someone had mysteriously entered their property, but not so much that it would be obviously seen. It was evident that his home invading actions were purely for his own entertainment and for the purpose of playing dirty tricks and mind games on the owners of the property he evades. In the year 1986, Daniel found himself in a series of unfortunate events which he would be forever known for. A house from their local area belonging to a family of three, a father and his two daughters, somehow drew Daniel's attention. He might have entered this specific address before and retrieved their family's phone number. After several days, Daniel began talking to the two daughters of the household, Annie Andrews and Jessica Andrews, both of similar age to Daniel. Daniel introduced himself and told the two girls that their family number was given by a mutual friend who went to the same school as them. He also made a whole new different persona and described himself as someone that is good-looking, athletic, blonde, and a well-educated boy who lived in their town. Annie Andrews, the oldest daughter, drew the attention of Daniel and decided to ask her out on a date one evening. When Andrew arrived in the front yard of Andrew's property, Annie was shocked to discover that the boy she had been talking to is the exact opposite of what she had imagined and how he had described himself. He was far from being the jock type, good looking guy she had thought. Instead, she finds herself standing in front of a greasy, dark haired and weird boy with no attractive features at all. 
Nevertheless, she still lets him take her to a local fair. Annie then made an excuse to go home after an hour. It was on their date that Daniel discovered that the two daughters had lost their mother to a grave disease, leaving only their father to take care of them. With this added information he obtained, Daniel's simple curiosity began to foster a great interest. Annie mentioned that it seemed like Daniel was obsessed with the passing of her mother, questioning her every little detail of the moment. Since the first date, Annie vowed to never see Daniel again. However, she would find herself in a much more disturbing event after realizing that he was not done with her yet. As teenage girls longing for their deceased mother, they attempted to contact her one evening by performing a seance in their basement. Out of teenage naivety, they are not really expecting anything from it to happen. Although on the same evening, as the girls were both asleep, they heard and felt a rhythmic knocking banging against their bedroom walls. Naive as they were, they thought that their seance had worked. They are both left with the thought that their mother was a supernatural force trying to send them a message. The banging and knocking on the door became frequent, so much that it would disturb the girl's sleep. Gradually, items and belongings in the house started to disappear and would be found in a completely bizarre and different location. Furniture would be moved on one side of the room as if a supernatural being was trying to play with them. They started telling about these occurrences to their father, Brian Andrews. But Brian believed that everything was just a product of his girl's imagination and it was just them causing havoc in their own home. He highlighted in an interview that he thought his girl's actions were just due to their emotional struggle at the loss of their mother. He refused to believe that everything the girls said could be real. The same event of knocking and banging on the wall continued, which drives the girls into near insanity. One evening, the girls heard a knocking again, but this time it was not on the walls, but in the basement. Armed with a kitchen knife, the girls decided to face their fears and confront the being that is causing their sanity to fade. As they walked inside the basement, ominous writing greeted them that said, I'm in your room. Come find me. Without hesitation, the girls ran outside of their house to ask for help from their neighbors. Their father arrived shortly after the incident. However, Brian is firm and still believes that his daughters are the ones responsible for such depredation. He told his daughters that they should go to counseling for help to overcome their struggling mental state. Several weeks later, a similar knocking happened again, but with even worse results. They were greeted with an I'm back, find me if you can message written in red on the wall. At first, the aftermath played out the same as before. However, this time, when Brian walked straight into the house, hoping he could prove to the girls that they were wrong, he was dumbfounded when there was apparent disarray inside the house as if someone had actually gone inside. He entered Annie's bedroom and found something painted on the wall. Marry me. It was at this moment he knew that the girls were telling the truth after all. On the other side of the room was an even more shocking revelation. He was greeted by a boy dressed in the clothing of his deceased wife. The boy had makeup on his face and a blonde wig. In his hands was a hatchet. The young boy was indeed Daniel LaPlante. Brian recalls during his interview with the police that there was a struggle ensuing upon his encounter with Daniel LaPlante. He was staggered at the fact that Daniel escaped without putting much effort. The night he reported the case to the police, it was in the investigation that revealed how Daniel was able to vanish all of a sudden. An officer found a hidden crawl space between the cupboard, which was built into the wall of Annie's bedroom. When he opened the hatch, he found Daniel curled up inside. He was then arrested shortly after the encounter. As soon as Daniel was removed from the scene, a thorough investigation and search were conducted by the local police. To their dread, they discovered that Daniel had been living inside the walls of the Andrews' home. He poked holes around in different rooms so he could observe Annie from whichever room she was in. With shreds of evidence, it was clear that Daniel had been pretending to be the ghost of Annie and Jessica's deceased mother 
for whatever reason he had. Daniel supposedly planned to reveal himself to the girls whilst the act of dressing as their mother. However, the fact that Daniel was wielding a hatchet at the time also suggests that the girls made a lucky escape during that terror night. In the following year, since Daniel was a minor, he was placed into a juvenile facility where he remained until the year of 1987 in the month of October. Immediately after his release, Daniel decided to continue the life he had always known, the life of burglary. In November, on his bizarre escapade, Daniel obtained two handguns from a neighboring house. On December 1, 1987, Daniel broke into the Gustafsons' household just a mile from the LaPlante family residence. There, he greeted pregnant Priscilla Gustafson, 33 years old, and her two young children, Abigail and William, with a gun. Her husband, Andrew Gustafson, was at work when the burglary-turned-murder occurred. Upon returning home, he was met with a gruesome sight that will haunt him forever. He found his wife, Priscilla, lying face down on her bed, with blood splattered on their bedsheets and a pillow on the top of her head. She had been raped by Daniel and shot multiple times in the head at point-blank range. He called the police as he saw his daughter and son both brutally drowned in two different bathtubs. From a burglar to a murderer, Daniel's motive for such horrendous acts was still unknown. It didn't take long for the authorities to link the family murder with Daniel LaPlante. With several pieces of evidence, an issue to apprehend Daniel sought by the police was administered. However, Daniel already fled the area. A manhunt was quickly conducted. Daniel robbed a woman and took her together with his car as he escaped. Fortunately, the woman managed to escape and run for her life. Daniel was then spotted by someone who had seen a photograph of him on the news. 48 hours after the manhunt, Daniel was found hiding in a dumpster miles away from the murder scene. Upon inspection, a hair strand of Abigail Gustafson was found on the sock he was wearing, key evidence of the involvement of Daniel LaPlante in the murder. A year after the incident, Daniel LaPlante was sentenced to three life sentences following the murder of the Gustafson family. He requested parole but was denied by the judge. Daniel left a family and community devastated. The court finds that the maximum penalty is warranted, Middlesex Superior Court, Helene Kazanjian said. Although Daniel LaPlante's murders were evidently horrifying and dreadful, as he deserved all the punishment he was put into for ruining a family's perfect life, we couldn't deny the fact that he was also just a mere product of the societal cruelty brought about by his childhood. Having no one to rely on, no family to guide him through, and having to go through such abuse at a very young age, it was clear-cut why Daniel LaPlante ended up in such a helpless fate. What are your thoughts about Daniel LaPlante's bizarre story? Tell us in the comment section. Also, make sure to like this video, subscribe to our channel, and hit the bell icon to get the latest updates. This has been Crime Diaries, and until next time, don't be another statistic.